You know where there is an absolute freedom, in my personal opinion? In Somalia. You take a gun and go build your freedom. We can't live a free life. If we live a free life, we may destroy everything. Freedom comes from inside. Guys, here is my new series about the most important country for every Russian. Of course, it's about the USA. Everybody in Russia is well informed about problems that exist in America. They envy us, we are so rich with natural resources. They want to dismember our country, it is so big it makes them jealous. Russian propaganda can talk about how American people suffer all day long. As Russia and China are building bridges, Americans have to tighten their belts. The prices in the country are higher than ever. Even Russian president is worried about Americans. Look at what they do to their own people. They are destroying the institution of family, cultural and ethnic identity of people. In this series we will discuss important topics like poverty and wealth in America, propaganda and freedom of speech, journalists' work, perception of the future and, of course, confrontation with Russia. We will compare how they see the world in Russia and in America and find out what makes us different. We've traveled to cities and small towns both in Russia and America, spoke to different people, from mayors to seniors, from homeless to IT guys, so get ready to know the true America. Today we'll talk about the freedom. In the national anthem, America is referred to as the land of the free. So let's take a look at the American freedom. I know quite a lot of people from the States, and I can tell you that the society that have the freedom tag on every corner is not actually free. We are now inside the Lincoln Memorial. Here is a 19 feet tall statue of the 16th president of the USA. The building itself symbolizes America. There are 33 columns for every state that had been united by the time Lincoln was killed. Abraham Lincoln is one of the key historical figures in America. He's the national hero. He was the one who abolished slavery and united America. The thing is Lincoln is famous for his striking quotes about freedom, which formed the the basis of the American society. It was a man who valued freedom more than anything else. We can be studying the personality of Lincoln, discussing how controversial some things in his biography are, but there are things that he never betrayed. And the American people of all generations agree on that. The idea that foreigners may find naive, the belief that there is nothing more important in the world than freedom. There are many quotes by Lincoln about freedom them, but there is one that I want to read out loud for you. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. If this place gets into despotism, I prefer immigrating to some country where they make no pretense of love and liberty. To Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. As I would not be a slave, as I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. For everybody to be able to enjoy the freedom, there must be a set of certain rules and laws. That's what Lincoln believed in, and that's what Americans believe in now. What's special about America is how freedom and rules coexist here. That's why Americans get defensive when outsiders try to tell them how to live. Russian propaganda has long been telling us that there is less and less freedom in the states, that America is on the verge of civil war. And it's true, the confrontation between Republicans and Democrats is strong, and American people admit it. In this regard, I'm wondering if this is the moment that Lincoln warned us about. I guess we better ask Americans about it. That's exactly what we'll do during our trip. And what will Russian conservatives tell you if you ask them about freedom in the US? LGBT. 
LGBT community is free to express themselves. Pride month, tolerance, etc. If you say the word, you'll be judged. Cancel culture. Even though it is appearing in Russia too, but in the States it works so well. Look at Johnny Depp. In Russia, freedom of speech serves the majority. While in the US it serves the minorities. If you are a minority in America, everything will work out for you. We are free for next generations to be free. American freedom is too constraining. I don't know how the next generation will manage. I wouldn't call myself a conservative person, but I think we all are a bit conservative here. For example, when it comes to sexuality. I mean, I've got a lot of gay friends, we get along well, but just recently my wife asked me what would I do if my son came to me and said, listen dad, I like boys. I was like, you know, I'm not openly against it, but deep inside, I guess I am. Let's ask Americans how these notorious minorities oppress them. We'll start with a fellow Russian who has moved to the States. Where are you from? Originally. I was born in Volgograd, but I never lived there. I lived in Megadan for 13 years, though. In Megadan? Yes. Singing a song about Megadan. So, when I was 14, I moved to Kaliningrad. Okay. After spending five years there, I moved to America for studies. And how long after did you find your soulmate here? Was it your plan to find a soulmate here? You know how in the late 1980s, early 1990s, Russian women were dreaming of marrying a foreigner and moving to America or Europe? Well, I didn't dream of marrying a foreigner. But I didn't have a stigma against it either. I mean, it wasn't like I missed the culture, so I wanted to be with a Russian man only. And I met my partner when I least expected it, when I was shopping. I ran into him three times when I was in that store. And the third time I realized I had to take him before somebody else did. It was like you saw him in one aisle, then in another one. On three different floors, he ran into me on the first floor, said sorry and ran away. Then on the second floor, we saw each other again, he complimented me and ran away. So he had planned it. He was basically stalking you. Well, we like to joke that I was the one stalking him, because I wanted a green card. Okay, do you have kids? Yes. How many and how old are they? One, a boy. He's five, he will be six in December, his name is Zachary. What propaganda in Russia often does is that they show the decaying West in comparison to Russia, where there are normal families with a mother and a father, where boys are boys and girls are girls, while in America in a year, your boy will start wearing dresses and all those pride parades and stuff. Absolutely terrible things, you know? And how can one bring up a healthy kid in a society like that? Can you tell us, as a person who was raised in Russia, who was brought up with our traditional values, what seemed weird to you here? And have you experienced any pressure from American society? How am I bringing up my son? He is a man. He says that he's Russian. Russian as well as American. That was his choice? Thank God he chose this. What about the schools? In Russia people say that American schools are oppressive, like they don't let parents decide anything, they force things on the kids. No, at our school it's pretty chill. We're lucky in this regard. Likely, I never had to make a choice or have a talk with the teachers. There was just one thing, when he was in kindergarten, we got a paper saying that they would have classes where they would explain about boys and girls, gay and straight, and they asked our permission. Which year, excuse me? That was pre-K. So they taught difference between genders already in kindergarten? Yes, but they asked permission. So you could refuse? I actually refused. You did? Why? Because I can't even explain to my son where babies come from yet. I cannot explain the details of sexual intercourse to him yet. So why would I explain other stuff? Like there are boys who believe they should be girls? 
I don't think that's appropriate in this age. So I felt the need to keep my son away from it. How many parents refused? Honestly, we didn't really discuss it among us, parents, but I know two more couples who refused it and one couple that signed it. They said they saw nothing wrong in it, like there won't be pictures, right? Ola's American husband agrees with her. Your dad wasn't demonized for teaching you how to be a man, you know? In today's time, it seems as though man is offensive <laughs> to a lot of people. And so, uh, institutionally speaking, you know, when you have school systems that are forcing rules upon you that your child has to share, you know, bathrooms with someone that may identify now as something different and now you have to start explaining all of these things to your five-year-old it gets a little complicated because how do you you haven't even gotten to the conversation of sex yet and what sex is and what sex organs are, are really are and what they're for In Russia, senior citizens are considered to be the most conservative. And what about America? Will they also criticize modern values here? We'll need to leave New York City for that. We can also check out the airport on the way. This is the only hotel situated right inside the terminals of JFK Airport in New York. So if you need to stay somewhere while waiting for your next flight and you don't want to get far from the terminals, I think that would be the best option. First, because of the history. Second, because of the proximity. And the hotel itself does look like a terminal. Someone is sleeping here, there are people with suitcases over there. It doesn't look as fancy as you would expect. Because the hotel is not the cheap one, you know? For your information, the cheapest room here is $440 a night, Texas included. And if you want one with the view, especially the view of the airfield, that'll be way more expensive. And it's not only a hotel, it is also a museum. There are exhibits from the 60s all over the hotel. There's old uniform of pilots and flight attendants, old cars and a huge number of antique interior items. For example, there are these old phones. It says that it costs 10 cents to call someone, but I'm not sure if it works or not. No, it doesn't. It works just like an ordinary phone. So you can call the reception or someone in one of the hotel rooms. But it's great how they preserved it all. And you can feel history at every corner. All of the exhibits are real. We are currently inside and what's interesting is how they designed it all in the 60s. This terminal was opened in 1962 and designed in the post-Second World War years during 50s and 60s. And look how much attention they've paid to the little details. There are virtually no typical elements here. The furniture is exclusive to this terminal, the shapes are unique, the doors, certain details, handrails, almost everything custom designed. This is how much attention they've paid to the architecture before. Today, most of the buildings we see look just like each other. They are very standard and it's very rare that an architect designs custom furniture. That's because today we're always in a rush. Clients try to cut expenses so there is no space for luxury. In the previous century they had this luxury. Luxury doesn't mean gold, everything made out of simple materials here. Concrete, glass, fabric, plastic, but how cool does it all look? Today you walk around admiring this building. And there is an old airplane standing on the runway. The plane has been renovated and it's just a decoration. There is a bar inside it. One of the interesting details in this terminal is this clock. That's hanging right in the center of this giant shell or bird, whatever it is. Anyway, 
there is this clock that looks like a little pearl. Yet again, note how detailed the design was. They found a place specially for this clock to be dominant element in the whole space. As I've already mentioned, it's not just a terminal, it's also a museum. There are different exhibits around the whole building. For example, there's a uniform exhibition on the first floor. The uniform of the flight attendants. And we can also see what they took with them on board. So here's a uniform from 1955. This one's from 1960-65. They wore this uniform in 1965. It looks just like Little Red Riding Hood, so we can see what passengers were traveling with back then. There are flight tickets, pins, travel kits. Who could have imagined they've had travel kits back then? When you fly in first class today, very rarely of course, you are given this travel kit and it looks like it's something very new, but no, they had them since around 1970s. They might be even better than those that we have today, the old ones have perfume. TWA is a legendary company, it was one of the USA's largest airlines. By the end of the last century it's gone bankrupt and it's been overtaken by its competitor American Airlines. American Airlines already had its own terminal at JFK, so they didn't need this one which came with the purchase of TWA. That's why they converted this terminal into a hotel. TWA itself no longer exists, but Americans remember and love it. And this is what the reception looks like. These are the former desks where you used to check in for flights. What's interesting is that there's even a luggage belt. It doesn't work now, although it would be cool if you could check in in the front desk, give your passport and credit card and you have your luggage picked up and just like at the airport sent to your room instead of the plane. There is still something to work on here. And of course, the main pearl of this terminal, these stunning departures and arrivals board. The flights shown up there are non-existent, so it's just a decorative element now. But back in those days, when the terminal opened in 1962, it was the first electromechanical flight information display system in New York. You can probably hear this clicking sound coming from it. You don't see these kind of displays now, they are long forgotten. Back then it was just the latest technology. Again, note how the architect designed this stand in front of the display. The structure which holds the travel information display board. So much attention to detail. It's such a futuristic design that even after 60 years it looks like something out of the ordinary. People take pictures with it in the background and that's what's so cool about it. It's super strong architecture that lives on for decades and stays relevant for years to come. To fully immerse visitors into the 60s, there are retro cars parked in front of the entrance. There are several cars here and there is even a car inside the terminal. And few more cars are still scattered around the parking lot. This also creates such a special atmosphere. Look how this terminal was made in terms of construction. Back then the technology was more primitive. The capabilities that builders have today didn't exist in the 60s and and I imagine that when an architect drew their futuristic plans and brought it to a constructor and a builder, they must grab their heads and said, what did you draw here? That's impossible. Now, when we look at this building from afar, it's so airy. It looks like some kind of butterfly, some kind of dragon skeleton. I don't know, you figure out what it looks like. Inside, you can immerse yourself into the 60s even more. They are historical photos on the walls telling about the era. Here is an interesting poster comparing 1962 to today. The US population was 186 million versus 331 million today. The average cost of a new house was 12.5 thousand and now it's 268 thousand. The average cost of a car has also increased by more than 10 times. It was almost three thousand dollars and now it's 37,876 Six, and a gallon of gasoline costs 28 cents and now it's 2.6 dollars. <laughs> Definitely not 2.6 for a long time now, of course. You won't find gas for 2.6 now, today it's 3.7 to 4 dollars. They gotta change the poster, prices are going up very fast. And finally, right from the terminal there is a, such a giant passage with an interesting illumination directly to the fifth terminal, which is a functioning JFK airport. Historically, like when you were young, when you, when you were 
you know, a teenager. <laughs> uh, what were, in your opinion, the greatest things that America had and that it no longer has? Probably more tolerance. I think we were more tolerant to the blacks, to the, the poor. We accepted the rich people. Gee whiz, I hope I get rich. Again, the politicians have divided us beautifully. We, it, it's, it's, un, it's just ridiculous. I'm sorry. Hold on just a sec, because this sounds, I mean, this sounds beautiful, but so uh, different. So you're saying that in uh, the 30s, America was a more tolerant society than it is now, with all the racial segregation, with, uh, you know, with the attitude to uh, black population and we uh, were, women's rights and such before the civil rights movement? I, I, I want to say we were tolerant within our group. Now, yes, we were very segregated. I had no bad feelings towards blacks, mm -hmm. none. We associated with them when we did, which was the exception, frankly, but I didn't look at that black man and say, man, he's trouble. Oh. It, I looked at him just as a black person. Now the politicians make sure that I hate that black man, which is wrong. And our politicians have done everything in the world to, quote, help the black population, which is a real problem in this country. And I think they have destroyed the black family. Black lives matter is wrong. It should black fathers matter because a father in a family means an awful lot. I hope you guys had good fathers. Another alleged violation of freedom in the States is Trump's ban on the leading social media platforms. He was banned after losing the election and after his supporters raided the Capitol. Trump was accused of inciting violence. He really called on his supporters to protest in front of the Capitol, because the election was rigged, according to him. However, it is questionable if his phrase, be there, can be considered a call to violence. On January 6, 2021, after a rally that took place not far from here by the White House, Trump's supporters headed to the Capitol following his call. And then something went wrong. Security was breached and the crowd got inside the building. Five people died in the Capitol attack. More than 150 were injured. The footage of the event spread all over the world. The main question that remains unanswered is whether it was part of the plan or not. Did they plan to storm the Capitol? There are people who are absolutely sure that the storm was planned, like they planned to overturn the election, but they failed. That's basically what Trump demanded from the VP Mike Pence. So the theory is that the storm was planned. I would call it a conspiracy theory, though. There are also conspiracies on the other side among Republicans. They also believe that the storm was planned, but it was planned by Democrats in order to frame Trump and Republicans. They say that in reality it was a peaceful protest and nobody foresaw any aggression, violence, let alone deaths. Anyway, the investigation is going on. It is run by the special counsel and the FBI. 700 people have already been arrested. Hundreds of others are wanted. A lot of people have been interrogated, from actual participants of the riot to the high officials of the US administration. There are those who have refused to speak, but I repeat, Neither the special counsel nor the FBI has confirmed that the riot was planned ahead. Sure enough, the consequences of this event will be there for many, many years. One of them is the further aggravated division of the nation into those who believe there was no storm, those who believe the storm and the crimes 
did happen, those who believe Trump never called for any violence, and those who believe Trump actually incited violence. Even Trump's ban on Twitter was one of the outcomes of the storm. There are a lot of outcomes. So we will try to talk to American people of different views and ask them what it was, what it caused, and what will it lead to eventually. After the attack, all the major social media platforms – Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat and Twitter – suspended Trump's account, which Donald Trump called an attack on free speech – an important American value. Can an election be considered fair if one of the candidates, Trump in this case, is not liked by the liberal media and social media and doesn't have access to millions of voters? Is this a competitive fair election? Of course, if I have to answer directly, the answer is no. If you just want me to say no, then no. But what you've just described is not where we are going with it now. The majority of people trying to take office and positions in the government won't be banned from any platforms. They are free to use them. If you tell me, what if in five years Twitter will ban all the Republicans, then yes, it will be bad for elections, because people won't be able to navigate through the political parties. However, Twitter is not the only platform to connect with the voters, so freedom of speech is fine here. People can use other things. Okay, name one social media platform with a more or less significant audience that hasn't banned Trump. If they have an audience or not is the choice of the audience, right? People can use what they want. No, they can't. Why can't they? Because when Trump launched his own social network, it works, you can sign up. But you can't have it on your iPhone or your Android, because both Apple and Google said they would ban this app from their stores. So I'm telling you, this is censorship. Yes, I can access his platform somehow, but that's not how it should work. As a founder of an initiative that fighting against censorship and that has come up with a mechanism to overcome all these obstacles, I can tell you I don't support a lot of things that Apple and Google are doing, including this one, but Talking about free speech, if people really want to know what Trump or Trumpists think, then there is an infinite number of places where they can learn it. So first of all, Twitter is a private company, right? So Twitter is not the United States government. You know, it's not like the United States government went and said, hey, Trump can't be on Twitter. Twitter itself, which is a company, said Trump can't be on Twitter for the specific reasons that he was inciting violence, right? If you and I started a company like, you know, Social Media Connect, let's say, and it gets really huge, and someone on our company um, is posting videos saying, you know, we need to attack this person, I think we, as creators of a company, can say, we don't want that content. Now, that doesn't mean I necessarily agree with Twitter's decision. I don't necessarily believe they made the right call, but that's, it's a, important distinction to make between the United States government and a private corporation taking an action. Which is still, I mean, the private corporation called Twitter is pretty mm -hmm. much a monopoly. I mean, can you consider elections to be a competition, an equal competition of candidates, if one of them doesn't have access to a social network like Twitter? Well, I think the fact that this is, you know, one of, this is a very rare example in the American political discourse. At no other time has an American, major American politician, been banned from a social media platform. In terms of whether Twitter is a monopoly, of course Twitter has a certain monopoly, but there's Facebook, you know, there's Instagram, there's lots of other um, social media have networks. Access to those two either. That's true. I mean, he still has a huge following overall. Big liberal media outlets were particularly active in fighting against Trump, but Americans view it as a clash of opinions, not censorship. I think when you call it a censorship, you are misusing this term, because 
Of course, there are some ethnicities, like New York Times, where the employees are affected by the ideology that the magazine promotes. And if an employee decides to write something that won't align with it, if they don't fit in the agenda, you mean? Okay, then they can be fired. Or they can be subject to social disapproval through Twitter, for example, which may really ruin their life. The things that we are discussing now are actually very simple. These are shortcomings of democracy. Shortcomings of democracy. What democracy leads to? I mean, everything has its shortcomings. Driving at high speed comes with advantage of taking us from point A to B quickly. But there are shortcomings too, for example, a chance of getting into a deadly accident. All the things with YouTube, Facebook and their actions are shortcomings of democracy. Because if it was an authoritarian society, then as soon as Twitter or Facebook appeared there, the US president would call CEOs of Facebook and Twitter over and tell them, you guys will have to follow this law. You must give the same treatment to all the candidates and would adopt a law like that. How does it work in America? There is a system of checks and balances. There is the president, then there is the Congress of two houses, each controlled by a different party now. The Supreme Court, where judges get lifetime appointments. There are state courts, etc. And there is media, that had traditionally been more liberal rather than conservative. Journalists are usually more liberal than conservative everywhere in the world. That's also a rather active part of society that believes in conspiracy theories, that is always opposing everything, and that is in general a bit aggressive. These are all components of the American democracy. So when new businesses emerged, like Facebook, Twitter and YouTube emerged once, there comes a controversy. What private companies can do, what antitrust laws should allow, and something we as humanity have never faced before. When, thanks to social media, everyone got the right to their opinion, to voice their opinion, I mean. The right to have one has always been there. As a result, some uneducated but very charismatic people, you must admit it happens sometimes, became opinion leaders. By the way, about the effect of social media. Taking into account that today's media, both state-owned and private ones, focus more on social networks when it comes to spreading information. Nowadays, people don't go to magazines, websites, they get most of the content from their feeds on social networks. I personally read news on Telegram and Instagram, others do it on Facebook. I think my feed is very well structured and I don't watch any newscast on purpose because I believe if it's really important I will see it on my feed anyway. If sometimes doesn't show up on my feed it means that it's not that important. Yeah, because you are following the sources that in your opinion provide you with the full picture. Exactly. So important stuff will find me. In general people get information from social media and since social media becomes become more and more powerful, there is a risk that tomorrow some media, no matter how free and honest they are, may just choose to restrict some users' accounts. I can speak for YouTube because that's the platform where I work. So if one day they choose not to promote my videos, like they'll say, we don't promote white curly men. Simply because we prefer men with straight hair, you know? No matter how good my content is, nobody's going to see it. So the whole Trump situation says a lot about it. The court did not decide anything on his case yet, but Twitter already banned him. He was not even given an opportunity to defend himself. One day he was simply cut off from millions of his followers. What do you think about the future where it will be up to social media, algorithm and CEOs to decide what's good and what's bad? 
what's right and what's wrong. Or like Mark Zuckerberg himself will decide this. What a great subject! I'll give you a lecture now. So look, social networks are relatively young. Even though some of them have been around for 10 years and more in comparison with media outlets of the past. So, they are now going through a stage that all other media, TV, radio, etc. have already surpassed. Not to mention newspapers. And the situation around Trump's ban on Twitter is a serious challenge for them. You might notice already that I always try to stay positive. And I'm an idealist as well. So if we all die, it will be fine anyway. Because it will make space for something better. In fact, what is going on with social networks now is obviously a formation stage. Although some of them are pretty old. Some of them were founded over 15 years ago. YouTube appeared in 2005, if I'm not mistaken. That's a short life comparison to what newspapers and magazines have been through. Or radio. Private radio stations appeared more than a hundred years ago. And television, which is almost a hundred years old. While social networks are only ten. They are basically in the infancy stage. And the rules are being written now. Naturally, people make mistakes and learn from these mistakes. In my opinion, this is exactly what is happening now. I think Trump's ban on Twitter is about this. I think it's great that it happened. I've always said it was great that America had Trump in the first place. No matter how I feel about him, he's a challenge. It's a test. And it's better to take it earlier than later. Trump's ban is a test. Another test of freedom of speech in America could be the subject of the war in Ukraine. It is forbidden to speak freely about it in Russia. Even calling a war a war is forbidden. One may think it is the same in the States, but in the opposite direction. Like you can't defend Russia and it's only allowed to support Ukraine. People who support the war don't talk about it openly. Or they can talk about it, but refuse to repeat it on tape. I've talked to a lot of people, I've been introduced to a lot of people who support the war or believe that it's not that simple. But these people refuse to speak when I want to record them. If I ask, can I record it? They go silent. They don't want to say their names. And if I ask them why, what are you afraid of? It is a free country. They reply, oh no, it is not free. They don't view the US as a free country. And they are scared of something even here. We talked about it in international security class. And we were studying. There's an American historian, Mirsheimer. In his opinion, Russia was forced to start the war. Because NATO was expanding. And America wanted to have its influence over Ukraine. And that's why Russia attacked it. And when he asked us what we thought about it, and there were around 20 people in the classroom, nobody agreed with him. I don't know how representative a sample of 20 people is. What I'm trying to understand is whether they didn't agree with that because they sincere disagree or because if you explicitly agree with this opinion I mean some people may really think so but if you say it's true that Russia was provoked by the US and that the US is to blame for everything like some Russians believe it you'll become an outcast you'll be cancelled you'll be expelled your scholarship will be taken away maybe that's why people here are scared to say certain things. I would say that in the terms of political opinions, cancel culture don't really work here. It is more about racism, feminism and things like that. 
or abortions, you know, like topics that are more relevant to the Americans. That's where cancel culture exists. And when it comes to international relations or politics, I haven't heard of anyone being cancelled for that. People don't really get cancelled for their political views. Others may disagree with you or ask you to prove your point, but you are unlikely to get cancelled for this or lose your friends. So the thing is, America is surely a horrible country, you all know it. And in this horrible country, professors that are called Kremlin propagandists can actually work at universities as big as UCLA, University of California, and share their opinion on the war with a huge number of students. Does he still work there? Yes, the university still works. No, that's what UCLA professors think of John Mersheimer. He actually works at the University of Chicago. Of course, he doesn't view himself as a propagandist. So he's working, he's not fired. He's working, but he's a very influential scientist, he can't really be fired. He is a tenured professor, you know? That means he's so cool that he can't really be fired. He can be suspended from teaching. So Biden can call the rector and say, I want that guy out, fire him now. I mean, I don't know. Or you won't get your order of merit. I don't know, honestly. As you can see in America, you can say publicly even the things that the authorities and the majority of people won't like. In Russia, this seems unthinkable. Given that since February 2022, thousands of websites have been blocked and dozens of media outlets have been closed. The freedom of speech in Russia also worries people in the States. That's why the Samusdat project was founded. It gives access to blocked media without any additional applications. My name is Sam Grossman. I'm the chief operating officer of Samizdat Online. I spent 20 years as a comedy television producer, uh, both in New York and Los Angeles. What brings you from media and comedy to political a political adventure like Samizdat? Firstly, it's both media, and there's a certain dark comedy to it. Um, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, the realities are pretty terrible, but the idea that you can ban information or block information or block anyone from knowing anything is so absurd that at some point you have to laugh. The, uh, when Jenya first told me about the project, I said, that sounds very nice, good luck. Thank you very much and I'll see you later. And we, we talked a little bit further and we talked a little bit more and uh, I realized that it's, the, the project has great potential and I can't think of a better way to change anyone's mind than to give them information. You know what, ha what has happened in Russia in the past 22 years, right? You know what is uh, happening in North Korea, in Iran, and other authoritarian society. Do you think anything like that could happen to America? Because we've traveled here quite a bit, and we hear from Democrats that uh, if Trump takes office, then in a little while we can have here what Russia has had in the past 22 years. And then we talk to Trumpists, and they say if Democrats take office, especially left-wing Democrats, then eventually we're going to have a dictatorship here. What scares me the most is uh, the NTV takeover in Russia in 2001. And NTV takeover? NTV. And you know about that? Yes, of course. Wow. And well, what about, uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> An American uh, committee on America. Russia don't know about it. 20, 21 years yeah. ago. Yeah, but that was, you know, having... having armed forces come in and take over a, a, a free media channel or a media channel not supportive of the political regime. It's terrifying from a, a, a democratic point of view. And I think uh, we have a soft version of that here uh, with these very uh, aggressive news channels, whether it's Fox News, whether it's uh, OAN, whether it's... Uh, what do you mean a soft version? Uh, well, it's and uh, you, you said armed man went into NTV, okay? And are there any armed men walking into? No, uh, but they, but the the NTV wasn't peddling the the Kremlin's storyline. So armed men came in and take it, took it over, and then they had to tell the Kremlin storyline. From then on, there was one night where they managed to figure out how to tell the end of their journalistic story, and then they had to essentially give up and uh, 
everybody quickly followed suit afterwards. And, and since then, I think most television in, in I, 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 from what I understand, in Russia has been uh, coordinated storytelling. And the journalism has been a little bit uh, what the Kremlin wants you to hear. Am I wrong? What also helps freedom of speech in America is that here you can hear different, sometimes opposing opinions. What uh, sources of information do you trust now? Where did you get news? Me personally? Yes, now. You know, I, I watch... Today morning, court. I, I try to do what I just said by watching different news channels, different networks. News channels, it's, it's, you mean television? Uh, television, I, you know, CNN, I, CNN. Fox. I mean, I am interested in knowing the bigger picture, so I uh, will, you know, look across different opinions and different news media sites to see what people are saying. My favorite thing to do is to watch uh, MSNBC mm -hmm. and then turn the channel over to Fox. Mm -hmm. And the same news story, totally different presentation. But you know, when you say totally, totally, when you say totally, um, can you give an example? Like how totally? Well, there was this, I mean, there, well, was this um, there was this riot in, in Washington on January 6th right. that, you know, the liberal stations may say it was an insurrection and the other channel may say they were just tourist people looking around the Capitol. I mean, literally that. And so are you saying that CNN only gave liberal opinions and did not give, give any conservative opinions? That's a, I can't say that overall, but yes, you know, CNN, depending on how you feel about their newscast, may be more truthful, if that's a correct word to use, than perhaps what, you know, Fox News. And the Fox News did Maybe. not give any other uh, viewpoints, no liberal experts? No. 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 And if they did, they belittle them. How stupid are they that they think that that was a riot? Obviously, that wasn't a riot. But, you know, you don't watch Fox News. Freedom of speech in the country depends on the authorities. If no one closes the media that criticize the president, then a small-town mayor won't be able to close a newspaper he doesn't like, or even influence what they write. Okay, what about your relationships with... Uh the local media. I mean, let's say uh, our friend Ken Ketchy, when he was editor of uh, the High Country Press, right. you know, would you know, would investigate and uh, would be strongly against you because you're a Republican and he well, a Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, what would happen? That's his option. As long as what he prints is honest and true, so be it. Because what he prints, whether it be I'm in favor of or not in favor of is should be the truth. And if I don't like it, I can tell him so. So you can you can tell him over dinner or anything like, "Han, I don't like what you're doing." Mm -hmm. That's about all the strings you can pull. That's right. Yeah. So you never were like the voice of uh, the governor or the mayor or any political party no. or any no. business group. Yeah. The the best uh, compliment I would get is people say, are you Democrat? Are you Republican? What are you? No one knew what affiliation we had. No one knew what our personal views were because we just reported news like the old days, you know? Maybe like you do. Well, maybe, maybe not, you know? Here are, here's the news. And didn't attach an opinion to it. Okay, because uh, it's very important how to press uh, finance this. Uh, where do they get money? I don't know how it's here. It's my next question, but uh, in Russia, it's uh, uh, it's a problem for regional press uh, to be independent because uh, there is no money, right. no advertising, right. and uh, so there is well because uh, there are no independent businesses, no independent business. But uh, uh, yeah, you have to take money from government uh, if you want to work, right. or from a big business, and uh, so. Uh, it, you, you can't be independent. Right. We were independent because we sold our advertising, you know. Yeah. It, and it, that adver but advertising... But it was 20 years ago. Right. What about now? 
uh, for the newspaper business, it's impossible, you know. And, because and now all, uh, sorry for interrupting you, uh, but uh, now all money is in social networks. Right. In YouTube and Instagram. And right. For local business also, uh, I think, better to uh, make uh, advertising on Instagram than to pay for local media. The internet's very powerful and it's a transition to more modern technology. So newspapers had their time and place in history and then it's been replaced by better technology, better ways to deliver you know, information and opinions, and that's where the advertising dollars go now, which means newspapers have gone the way of the horse and buggy. As we learned from Trump's story, our freedom is affected not only by the government, but also by corporations, especially huge online monopolists that know almost everything about us. We've been talking today with Ilya about like Google today, they know everything about us, like literally everything, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, tomorrow they can actually dictate you, uh, your menu, uh, restaurant menu, ideological menu, all sorts of menus, right? So in about 10 years from now, they'll probably uh, be ready to uh, make families for us, make choices for us, you know, make all the choices for us. So what happens tomorrow? Will there be Google or somebody else? But will there be like one huge, uh, Ever and everything covering uh, institution. Yeah, Amazugal, right? And it'll be Amazugal, Gugazan. Yeah. Uh, Who'll make all the choices for us? You, I, it's kind of already happening. You know, if you shop on Amazon now, you, you only know what's there. You don't know, if it's not on Amazon, you don't know that it exists. Maybe. You, you know to go to Etsy if you want to find a, a certain art project. But are you, why bother? Because with Amazon, it'll be here tomorrow. It's more fun. I know if, I, if, if the stuff arrives right away, I can fill my time with all kinds of other things. I'll let it. The thing is, the more fun it gets, the more we'll let these menus be dictated. The more we'll let our families be dictated, the more we'll let Amazugal decide exactly what we should do tomorrow. Imagine that knowing all your preferences, tomorrow Google will be able to shape not just your taste preferences or something else, but it will create your life, it will choose your wife, not, but it will explain why this one and not that one, and after a while you will be living according to someone else's program. Such an algorithmic approach to controlling people, it naturally completely distorts everything. People don't know that they are being experimented on. Facebook publishing, everything in the last couple of years, and now information is available to everyone. But despite that, people don't have any outrage about why it's even acceptable that Facebook can do all this. It's not like anyone gave permission to do this, right? Millions of people are controlled by Facebook. Facebook is showing that not only are they doing different experiments, it's already in use. They do experiments, they lead people here and there, and people, of course, individually, but the mass can be controlled. And Facebook has verified by looking at 50 or 75 likes of a certain person, they know everything about them. They just see that a person has liked 75 things somewhere and they already have a complete picture of what the person is. They know completely how to lead this person further, what to show them so that they do what they need to do. And what do they have to do? To buy something, right? Because Facebook right now is only interesting in selling something, okay? Well, that's not really a bad thing, yeah, because it's commerce. They are manipulating, but they are manipulating to sell something. That's bad, because it could be a lot worse. What if they just start manipulating who will marry whom, who will live where, who will do what professionally, and so on? What's wrong with that if it makes you happy? You've had a menu of life grown up for you and you're perfectly happy. Well, again, we can talk for hours about it. I don't remember if we mentioned it before, that there is a lot of last choice in China. People live in China and they are subjected to... Authoritarianism. Uh, I forget the word. Authoritarianism. Yes, authoritarianism. <laughs> if you ask the average Chinese person, not the poorest, but just the average Chinese person, what do they think about their life? Well, they can go fishing with their kids, they can go abroad, 
They can buy themselves a car, they can watch Netflix or something similar, equivalent, and they'll say that their life is perfectly normal. And you'll tell them, but you can't speak out because you don't like your life, you don't like the state. And they'll say, but I don't need to. I don't need to, that's right, so okay, what happens a hundred years after that, when everyone lives very modestly because it's dangerous to go over any boundaries? All the dreams, all the inventions disappear, because in order for people to invent, they have to be free to think, they have to be free to communicate, they have to be free to say something that nobody likes, and then there is this meat grinder of ideas. And out of that comes everything we have now. If China had run everything for the last 300 years, none of this would happen. That's how I see it. America is going for the same thing now. A monopoly of social networks, which is getting stronger and stronger, the monopoly of corporations, which is also beginning to dictate the agenda and feel its power. Today it's commerce, but tomorrow they will elect the president. Today they are already trying to influence it in one way or another, and the day after tomorrow, feeling their power, they can do anything they want. Yes, they can. But what fool is not afraid of Zuckerberg? He's a first-class monster who has taken over the most powerful, well, not taken over, but created, and has written himself into this contract in such a way that it's impossible to get him out. No one has any voice but him. He'll have someone there whispering in his ear, but in the end, they do whatever he wants, and he's clearly not worthy of that position. Everybody sees it. He donates a huge amount of money to charity for different social programs, to help all kinds of people. He's a young guy, a product of the American system, American society, American values. Doesn't he understand that monopoly is bad? Does he want to go down in history as a dictator? I don't know what he understands, but clearly he's not acting like he understands that. He's acting like a man who doesn't know he's a dictator. Maybe Putin is a dictator who doesn't know he's a dictator. I don't know. It seems to me that these people know what they are doing. In Russia, a lot of people believe that the state and US secret services control Facebook through Zuckerberg, and if necessary, they can call you and say, guys are doing this, this and this. There was a precedent recently in Russia, when they took away Yandex from, well, Yandex, they took away the main page and gave it to Vkontakte, which is under the presidential administration, and they took away the news, they took away Zen, well, just because they could. They took away their news portal and said, guys, we will take over the news, and nobody from Yandex said a word, which means that they probably had a call from someone explaining to them that, guys, you have to sell or give it up if you want to continue to work. Does someone in the US, intelligence agencies, some individual politicians, people, control California companies? I don't see any evidence that in any way the government has any control over anything at all. America right now is just an avalanche in the mountain. There is no control. There is no democratic control. There is absolutely nothing the government can do. There's just a lot of money, a lot of corporations that in their own interest stay in charge of their own companies and do whatever they can to make money. People live very luxuriously here, for the most part. There are exceptions, of course, but for the most part, People here do live very lavishly and they don't care about anything like that. But if the state somehow controls this, that's the only thing they control. Because they obviously don't do anything else. I don't see it. All right, if we are talking about the future and the threat of total control by some new entity like Google, Facebook, or a new government that will decide for people what they will choose and how they will live, then how can we counter that? For example, I'm a political observer, I know how people historically have resisted dictatorship, and what conditions must be met for a dictator not to appear in the country for such and such a time. What needs to be done here, again, since you are in the IT field? I think what needs to be done here is for people to just be calm. That's the only thing that works at all. 
I think for people to just become, not to be agitated all the time, not to be annoyed all the time, not to be offended all the time, there is a tendency to be offended and irritated and angry and resentful of anything. That's a bad thing. And I already said that sooner or later, I hope that there will be some tech companies that will be attractive enough to the average person to lure them away from Facebook or YouTube and so on and do something similar but differently. And where are the guarantees that one day these companies won't turn into new Facebook and the new Google? There are no guarantees anywhere. But the main thing that global corporations can deprive us of is freedom of choice, but for now it still exists. So does the freedom of choice of politicians in America. Let's begin uh, with, uh, with the elections here. As I know, you, uh, you were elected, yes. not, not appointment, but in, in Russia, uh, there are uh, Most mayors, mayors are appointed. In, uh, big, especially in big cities, they are appointed by local deputies. So uh, you were elected. Uh, can you maybe tell us a little about elections here? Uh, elections uh, here in the U.S. and in our little community, uh, we're elected by the majority of voters. Male, female, uh, white, black, purple, pink, red, they all have the option to vote. As an elected official, you, you strive to work with everybody, whether you agree with them or not. You try to work with everybody to achieve that common goal of what's best for the community as a whole. So when the elections come about, you've addressed these issues with the public and either they believe you and vote for you or they don't believe you and don't vote for you. So did you have competitors and who were they? Yes. Uh, you know, you always, you always, well, the f first election I had uh, was running against the incumbent mayor. He'd been in 20 years. But uh, the public as a whole felt like it was time for change. And uh, so I was elected in 2017. The election, I'm, uh, I run every two years. And in uh, 2019, I ran unopposed. Nobody ran against me. Uh, in uh, 2021, there was a former council member that decided to do a write-in vote. An individual, if you don't see somebody on the ballot that you would like to vote for, you can write somebody in but it still takes the majority. Uh, whoever wins that election has to have the majority of votes. So have there ever been situations during the election where somebody would say, oh, he's not playing a very as game, you you know? Yeah, as, as, as you remember, uh, on the last president elections in the United States, uh, Trump supporters uh, accused uh, the Democrats of fraud and uh, have fair elections here. So does anything like that happen at mayor's election? Well, any scandals was here. In America, you have to consider that everybody has a voice, whether it be wrong, right, or indifferent. So you can say, <clears throat> as long as you are not discrediting somebody, you can say whatever you wish to say, whether it be true or not. And during that last election, uh, there's still a lot of controversy over that election. Well, what was true? What was fact? Right, but uh, speaking uh, about your election, like mm -hmm. mayor's election in Blown Rock, did you have any accusations on the part of your political opponents? No. In small town elections, you tend to, it, they tend to stay very, I say, cordial and strictly to the issues, the issues at hand. What is best for the community as a whole? You don't have a lot of negative input, which is good, because it's not about, uh, personalities. It's not about uh, um, how you wear your hair or your, uh, how you dress. It's what you can do for the community. Where officials are actually elected, there surely won't be any willfulness and corruption. As a mayor, uh, can you do literally everything, anything you want? about the community. Let's say you want to, uh, you know, make this Blowing Rock Park and Museum uh, state property. You want to nationalize it. Uh, can you do, are you like no. almighty? No, no, you're not. The mayor, anytime it's uh, issues pertaining to the town, the mayor will defer the town manager 
that handles the monies and manages the people in the town or the employees of the town. Any decisions, major decisions, have to be agreed upon by the group, the council as a whole. Before, the only time a mayor can make decisions uh, would be under an emergency situation. Okay, so let's say you want to change asphalt on the road. You can just make a phone call no. and say, no. No, that is up to the council as a whole. As a mayor of Long Rock, are you in any way subordinate to mayors of other bigger towns or the governor of uh, North Carolina or the president of the United States? Let's say the governor of North Carolina doesn't like you, doesn't like what you do. Can he or she, again, make a phone call and get rid of you? No, only the voters can do that. Only the citizens. Both formally and informally. Formally and informally. Unless I, as a representative, a mayor, did something that was um, illegal, then the state or the judi judicial system could get involved if you do something illegal. You're a representative of all the people in your little town, so you want to do everything right. You want to be there for those people. Okay, let's say uh, the government of the United States mm -hmm wants to build a road, interstate, that would go through Blowing Rock. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people of Blowing Rock don't like the idea, mm -hmm. and you don't like the idea. Mm -hmm. What happens? Before a, a large project like that can happen, it goes in front of a public hearings. These public hearings involve elected officials in the community, and these citizens get to voice their opinions and why they don't feel like, say, the road is good for their community. And sometimes the citizens will win out and the project will not happen. Other times, if the government feels that the project is best for everybody, it will happen. So it's case by case. Okay, it sounds pretty ideal, too good to be true, and there's no and way you can office. control the judicial system. No, judicial because, I mean, system. The prosecutor may be your longtime friend because you've lived in the same area, in the same neighborhood, same community. I've got a few judges that are friends, and they simply say, Charlie, I can give you some advice, but I can't help you. <clears throat> the judicial system is a system unique of its own. It has generally the ultimate say-so, yes or no. And so they have to be very unbiased. You're always going to have somebody in a group that's not going to follow protocol. That's normal. That's human nature. But in most cases, at least, you know, majority of people I have seen in my short time in politics, the majority seem to be honest and doing it for the right. Do you want to see a town where a mayor gets voted in? Let's go Petersburg, an American one. So welcome to Petersburg. I was actually born in its Russian namesake. In 1650s Fort Henry, now Petersburg, marked the western and the southern extent of English settlement in and knowledge of Virginia. On 27 August 1650, Edward Bland, merchant and land speculator, and Abraham Wood, frontier militia commander, left Fort Henry on the first documented English exploration of Southside Virginia. And now it's a town called Petersburg. It's a small town on the outskirts of Richmond, which is the capital of Virginia state, so it's like Himki if we compare it to Moscow. Himki are actually near to Leningradskaya Highway, look how it's all connected. Yes, and so it's a small historical town, so let's walk around it, possibly we'll find something interesting here. Actually, there are quite a lot of Petersburgs in the USA. The most famous one is called St. Petersburg and it's in Florida. However, we have Petersburg here, there's also Moscow in the nearby state, there are a total of six or seven Moscows in the US. There are definitely over three Petersburgs. Here come the locals. That's a whole group of happy Petersburgers. 
Не, не буду цитировать. Pebble stones here, pebble stones there, crude pebble stone all around. There are, aren't any new buildings here. You can probably make a film here. Look, you can easily film a report for Russia Today here. Oh yes, Russia Today. Look at the America's very bottom. Look at these degrading rotten buildings. There's mold everywhere. This is the America's very bottom, said Verlamov, standing near cool cars. Loaded with all sorts of equipment. Oh, and most importantly, here's Krasny October. It looks just like it. A red brick building. There used to be a factory here, and now the hipsters are going to rebuild it. A real Petersburg back alley, because Petersburg without a back alley isn't a Petersburg. Come on. We found a back alley as we should in St. Petersburg. True, of course, here you need to find the passages through the alleys. It's very cinematic and I can see someone filming a chase scene here. Absolutely. More than that, if we record the clip here with the words... And this is one of the districts of St. Petersburg that not everyone has seen before. And here are the communal parts. Then a lot of people will believe it. This is where you can film St. Petersburg, at least in the specific spots here. As it should be in Petersburg, restaurants, restaurants, restaurants. Restaurants and hotels. This one was built back in 1872. And I was born in 1972. Doesn't that look like a picture of early 20th century St. Petersburg? If you take away Western Union, on drugs and all the other English signs, it looks just like Nevsky Prospect. At least most people who haven't been to St. Petersburg will agree with that. What other criticism does Russian propaganda have of American freedom? That's right, everyone there is a drug addict. There are no other way to explain their decadent culture. The first states to legalize marijuana in the US were Colorado and Washington in 2012. Now medical cannabis or cannabis oil is legal in all US states, and in most states you can buy it for recreational purposes too. Oh wow, look, there is a cannabis farm over there. Well, to be honest, they are practically everywhere around here. And that's because Maine is one of the states where marijuana is legalized. Locals can have up to 70 grams on them, so that's like a big full bag. Can you explain to us how it's worked here? What's the law? Okay, so Adult Use Recreational Cannabis Program in Maine has been legal for over two years now and recreational shops are just starting to open because it just took that long. The reason being for that, state was still working on their regulations and restrictions, which are separate from the medical program. The reason that it took so long for shops to open is because one of the rules for the rec program is that you have to supply your recreational store from a recreational grow. And the state is covered in medical certified grows so there's no problem with supply, but supply is a problem with the recreational program. So if you don't have a recreational grow or have a, a recreational grow to source from, you can't sell it in a recreational cannabis store. And what's the difference between recreational and medical or are there any other? So the basic differences, which are more like challenges, is amount of shops, selection is much smaller, in a recreational store, and that would be for any and all products, whatever they may or may not sell, cartridges, edibles, flour, and it's much more expensive due to the supply problem, and the state has a much higher tax on it. And you're a medical. And we shopper. are a med shop. So like uh, for us to buy something here, we would need to show prescription? Main state medical marijuana card. Mm -hmm. The medical program has been legal for going on 15 years now. And same thing happened though. There were no stores when the medical program first started. There was just private caregivers and farms. You had to know somebody or you had to contact or be introduced. But you still had to have a card. You had to show it to them when you went to the farm. But so this farm has been operating for 10 years, Tabitha, uh, but our shop has only been open for three okay. because we operated solely out of the farm. I was a patient with the farm. That's how I met the family that runs it, that owns it. And I'm very 
I pay a lot of attention to my medicine, so that's how I got my job. Is and when they opened the shop, they asked me to work behind the counter. So you were a patient. I am right? a patient. If you still. don't, you're a patient with what kind of disease? Uh, uh, so why did they prescribe? That's the other thing. The medical program, because it was very restricted in the beginning, but lobbyists and people that I was with, me and Green Cross, we fought at the political level and lobbied for less restrictive laws for patients. Mm -hmm. So there is no pre-qualifying condition in the state of Maine to get a medical marijuana card. So hold on a sec. I can just come to a doctor and say, resident. I want to be you patient. You have to be resident. You know, it's interesting because in New York City or in some other big cities, we saw, um, you know, people who would uh, smell of marijuana and they would be mostly like homeless. And here, like when we entered the shop, you know, Decent people, there was this elderly woman, you know, obviously not poor, maybe rich, and so it looks so clean and so nice and neat. Who are your customers? When we first opened, I'd say 50% of our customers who were new to this were senior citizens. Senior. Yeah, and they were mostly looking for topicals to put on the skin for arthritis. Mm -hmm. because we have a wide selection of CBD products and we promote heavily the use of CBD, uh, full spectrum CBD because it has a minute amount of THC in it, which you need to activate your other cannabinoids. Uh, there are a lot of CBD products out there that are knockoff. There's a lot out there that have absolutely no THC and they do not work the same. I had to not help a lot of elderly, older folks, if you will, navigate the world of cannabis, which was very interesting, especially when they came in here and looked at me, you know. But once I opened my mouth, people seemed to warm up to me, no matter what I look like. <laughs> Recreational program, uh, like I said, selection, availability is an issue, and you're not allowed to buy as much milligrams of edibles. And what I've heard by researching from people who do go to rec stores is that majority of the flour they sell has a lower potency level. So you're paying more for lower potency cannabis or whatever else products that you are. And I believe the recreational bud tenders, because what I am is a bud tender, mm -hmm. uh, the recreational bud tenders are not allowed to suggest anything for an ailment like sleep, pain okay it's against the rules for them to do that so like for example if i if i would ask you to recommend me something like i have lower back pain yeah you know if this was a rec some, store or sometimes I would... problems with sleep so would you like recommend me what i can get so because you're in here whether you buy something or not yes i can tell you but if this was a recreational store adult use store it's not allowed a lot of people back where we are from, from Eastern Europe, you know, they believe that like uh, mm, marijuana is a very strong drug and, you know, people who smoke are, well, they become dangerous and aggressive more so than those who consume alcohol. What's your observation, like living here, working here? So I would never stomp on somebody else's opinion, but that's just what we call stigma, generalized perception of the reefer madness, you know? It's old school thinking and things are starting to change. As you see, we have quite a few older adults come in here and buy their medicine. So old school but here. But there are still people yeah. who think that people who use marijuana are just dirty potheads and hippies. So, you know, it's the same everywhere. The guy who works here at the counter who can suggest different marijuana-based products to the customers is called a bartender. And so, Rob has been named the bartender of the year in Maine in 2022. We came to the right place. So we came to the right place with you nominated the bartender of the year. Bud. 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 Ah, so I misheard it. I thought that this job is called a bartender. 
but it's actually a bud tender. Bud is a slang word for flower here. I've been to places like this in many different cities and countries, and here I and Stas have to agree and warn people that drugs are bad for you. Marijuana became legal in the US not long ago, but Americans have been killing themselves with fast food for a long time. I suggested to Stas that we stop by a fancy hipster cafe, especially since Portland is famous for its comfort for us elderly hipsters. But Stas said, Ilya, let's be like ordinary Americans, let's go to a diner. And we didn't come to try any diner, but Portland's best diner. In fact, if you find yourself in America, you want to have a big breakfast, where there's a huge choice of everything, a diner is the best place to go to. Let's go. Well, since you and I must somehow oppose each other, I can say that I hate diners. And I hate them because they are an example of unhealthy American food. There's a lot of bread, a lot of sauces, an incredible amount of calories. Yes, it's delicious, I'm not arguing with that, there are dishes that are good, but it's all about giant portions. It's an example of unhealthy junk food that is hard for me, an athlete, to take in. Then there is, of course, the main course at the diner, which is terrible coffee. Can I smell yours? No, don't. It usually smells like some kind of burned paper, something not very pleasant. But Stas loves diners and thinks it's an important part of American culture. The point is not that Stas thinks that diner is an important part of American culture. Never mind what Stas thinks. The important thing is that the diner is the huge part of the very American culture. And Ilya, of course, spoke not as an athlete, because he didn't run or swim today unlike me. And secondly, Ilya spoke out as a person who opposes freedom as such, because what's so different about a diner? Of course you can choose anything you like here. You can choose some huge dish or you can choose like we ordered eggs benedict with lobster, which very tasty, healthy, nurturous. And I don't think it's bad for you. Of course you can add to that like I did, for example, two more toasts, which you can then spread different jams on if you want, but it's up to you. It's your own choice. I certainly don't want to say anything terrible about Ilya. Ilya is used to choice, but that's because he travels a lot. But mentally he's not used to the inner responsibility that one constantly exhibits themselves here. This diner in Portland, like many good diners, is popular. We waited practically 40 minutes to come in here, because it's a very popular breakfast spot. Precisely because of the very large selection. I mean... Look. One, two, three, four. Don't cover me up. Well, it's hard not to do it. The menu is so huge. The choice of dishes is really huge. They offer 10 kinds of omelets for breakfast alone. Egg Benedict. Egged one way. Egged a different way. Same with pancakes too. There's a really big selection. And the hallmark of the diner, of course, is the people who sit at the counter. There are those who don't like the so-called booths. We are sitting in a booth right now. This is called a booth. And this is a counter. And for a huge number of Americans, especially if you come alone, the counter is the best, just the perfect place. You come in, read a newspaper, eat, and suddenly you meet someone new. Another gem in diners is the waitresses. On the one hand, diners means canteen. On the other hand, of course, it's not a canteen, it's a restaurant. Though very simple. The waitress brings you food, talks to you. In fact, almost every waitress, I didn't have any other examples, is able to tell you everything about the city, about life, argue with you, joke with you. Joking with waitresses, in general, is a must. It's a pity you don't have a sense of humor. Well, look, I traded it in school for a foreigner razor along with my conscience, so it's okay. We all did in Soviet Union, it was accepted. As for coffee, you have to taste a coffee in a diner, because, of course, it's not a coffee, it's a coffee drink. 
It's completely different. It's like looking at this glass of water here and expecting to be mineral water or something, but it's just water. So you also have to take it easy with coffee. By the way, I very rarely drink coffee in a diner. It's like going to McDonald's and ordering french fries, for example, which everybody thinks of as unhealthy, but still a lot of people like. Anyway, I always have an argument with the waiters at the diner about coffee. I say I'd like coffee after my meal, and they say, how, that's not right, we have to pour coffee right away, so today is no exception. Stas told me that Portland is famous for its street art. Actually, it's not just Portland, it's found in many American cities, especially in former industrial cities, which are gradually gentrifying, where some trendy coffee shops are opening, expensive housing is being built. Well, in order to brighten it all up, they paint the walls with street art. Portland is no exception. There's nothing interesting in terms of street art here, however. It's pretty provincial, boring art. But they are put plugs up there, saying something that's probably very important and interesting to them. And even on the outskirts of Portland, we see this urban wonder. In fact, in the States, it's everywhere in cities and towns. It's literally called storm pots, rain gardens, eco-drainage, you name it. It's created for water drainage. Russia has a big water problem. After every rain, the city begins to flood. People say, where are the storm drains? And it used to mean that the water should go into the storm sewer and dumped somewhere in the sea. But then people realized that on the roads, water is dirty. And picking up water from the dirty streets where all kind of machine oil and other nasty things and dumping into the sea is not very eco-friendly. So they decided to recreate the natural water cycle. So how does it work? Water flows onto the the road, then special areas are created here, in this case with grass, and water flows down here, fills the pot, and then naturally goes into the ground, being filtered with special grass that is resistant to contaminated water. Then it gets into the groundwater, there is a natural cycle. In case there is too much water, there is a special tank, it is elevated and the water will go into the classic drain, but only if there is a heavy rain. And all the fine precipitation they go into the soil as originally intended by nature. On the one hand, it's environmentally friendly. On the other hand, it's beautiful. Because we are standing at crossroad and we see this stunning tall grass. There are also sometimes bushes, flowers. All in all, it's beautiful, practical and environmentally friendly. Another iconic image of freedom from the middle 20th century is a biker. There was a movie called Easy Rider with Dennis Hopper. After that, a man on a motorbike became a symbol of rebellion, youth and freedom in America. Although a lot of these rebels are not young anymore. Well, so uh, like the regular question, we just began our conversation okay. and you said like uh, it's normal for people over 50 to, you know, become bikers right uh -huh. this, is a, this is a group 60 mm -hmm. this is a group we're called the roadhogs and what we do is we bring our motorcycles on trailers mm -hmm. behind motorhomes like big buses and that's what we live in and we spend our week or two here in maine just traveling around doing different rides every day there's a different ride we have a leader we have a sweeper that makes make sure everybody gets through the lights and, and everything's done safely, everybody wears a helmet, and we've been doing it for years. So, I mean, it's just uh, recreation, you just... This is pure recreation, yeah. This is pure recreation. Some of us still work, some of us are retired. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have our phones and we'll see, we get messages, and when we pull over for a stop, everybody gets on their phone, does their business, and then gets back on the bike and we take off. And how many of you? Well, today, there, this is a very small crowd because we thought it was going to rain. Mm -hmm. Yesterday we had 37 bikes. So did they. But they, they go out differently in five different groups. And we all meet at the same place at the end, uh, at, at, during the day, at lunch. And then we all take off static, we static. Go out fi five minutes later, another group goes out. Five minutes later, another group go goes out. You know, a question which may seem weird uh -huh. to you. But the thing is, we've heard that uh, like bikers, 
they are like a special group, a special gang with a special mindset, with a special everything. All Republicans, uh, all Trumpists. Is that true or what? It's hard to explain. I would say that 90% of us are not Democrats, but we're not Trumpers. Um, we believe that uh, hard work gets you the ability to do the things that we do. We don't ask for anybody to give us it. We got it ourselves. I mean, I've been working since I was 12 years old. So, um, you know, and I still work. So, yeah, I agree with it. But we're not all flying truck flags or anything like that. We just want to make sure that, um, you know, we'd like to go back the way it was. This is not for us. I don't like pulling up and spending five dollars on a gas uh, a tank a, uh, a gallon of gas my diesel is uh, over five dollars and i'm i'm spending a thousand dollars on a tank for a, of diesel for our co for our motor coach so yeah i'd like to see things back differently but no there's no mindset we love to ride these guys have been riding hundreds of thousands of miles gone all over the country but they just love to ride it's got nothing to do with politics it's got nothing to do with you know gangs and mines how old is is your oldest biker um, how, how old is, uh, is um, our oldest guy? Is 83? Who's the oldest? I know 81. That's Roger. Roger's got to be the oldest. 81. Roger, wow. Yeah. 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 Roger drives a trike. A trike is three wheel motorcycle. Freedom is one of the main uh, values in the United States. What does yeah. this mean for you? What is freedom? Freedom is the ability to wake up and decide to do something I want to do and go do it. And I have nobody tell me I can't. That's what it's all about. Every day, that's all. I wake up and I say, what am I going to do today? And I go do it. Any problems with freedom no. in the United States Zero. right now? Zero. Nothing. We're free to do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it. There are some places that are a little bit stricter when it comes to COVID. But I, I, I live in Florida. Florida has been open since COVID started. You know, we never really got into a... We wore our masks and things of that nature, but we never were able to do what we wanted to do. We just had some... There was changes on how we did it. But gradually and faster, and that's why Florida and everybody's getting down to Florida. If you look at most of our plates are from Florida. Mm. We're far away from Maine. And we all drove up here, not on the bikes, put them in our trailers. But, but to be able to afford the bike like that, you, I guess you got to be, let's say, not poor at least. Yeah, it's, it's you know, I mean, it's an expensive. Anything you do that is um, <clears throat> recreational, it's not... Uh, it's not, it's not a necessity when you have to eat or you have health care or things of that nature. If you don't have anything after that, you can't do this. This is a luxury. And we've all worked very hard to get to a position where we can do these things and not have to worry about it. It's important that freedom also means that you have an opportunity to travel. And this wonderful biker mentioned it's waking up in the morning and doing what you want to do. Not a lot of people can afford that. Maybe a person becomes free when they get old, because when you are young, you have to work. You have a lot of commitments, you are bringing up children, so when you wake up, you need to go and earn money. But when you are old, you can do what you want, travel all over the place and really become free. To be able to afford that, you need to start working at 12. You and I both know what it is, though. So if you are lucky enough, unfortunately, we can't call ourselves free now, so we have to work and discover America. American freedom is very much about the road, about going somewhere. You don't have to be on a bike, you can also be in a camper van. Should we go to the van campground? So it's not just a camping site, but a camping site full of vans. They are different houses, big and small. Holden family, so it's family-owned campground. So that's what a van campground looks like. Here's the office. The owner of the place doesn't want us to film her, but gave us a note with prices. One night stay here costs 50 bucks, which isn't that expensive. One week is 315, that's all with VAT. For a four-week stay you'll pay $941, and if you want a spot here for the whole summer, it'll cost you $2825. On top of that you will have to pay for the electricity. It's 
it's not just a parking lot for camper vans. They also has a nice swimming pool here. Stas quickly noticed it, because he liked to swim. There is also this little house with toilets, and probably there are some showers around here too. Yes, there are showers, there are also a laundry with washing machines and everything else. And I'm not sure if Ilya has already mentioned it, but there are 44 parking spaces for camper vans that are fully booked for the whole season from May until October. The people who come here do so in all these different types of vans. There is also an option to put a tent outside. Apart from the vans themselves, people also bring cars, motorboats, sailing ships, bicycles and everything else. And then people just travel. It's very much about lifestyle. You have a home, but every summer you take your family out to live in a new state. One year you can live in Maine, next year you can go to California, then Oklahoma and so on. I'm Blake Gandy. From Mike uh, Perry? From Moose Town, Mississippi. And what's your name? I'm sure you can. Bo. Bo? Yep. Great. How old is Bo? He is uh, seven months. Yep. And already a traveler? Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah, about three months in, he was a traveler. Okay. And how long have you guys been on the road? I've been doing it since 2018. Since 2018? Yes, sir. So uh, you live here? Uh, we, well, not here. We do this for a living. We, we travel different different places across the United States working. Uh, so you work and travel? Yes, sir. Yeah. And so you do it for a living? So what exactly do you do? Uh, we actually do maintenance on uh, paper mill boilers that where they make paper. They actually have uh, boilers and we do the service on the, uh, the maintenance service on the boilers. And you're seeing uh, trailer campgrounds, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So it's not for vacation, it's for well, beautiful. Both recreation and work. Both recreation and work. work. When we're not at work, we travel, you know. Yep. So where do we go from here? Uh, we'll go to uh, Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. And when you stay here, like right now, right here, you're staying for a vacation or on both? Well, well, working. 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 Yeah. working. Yeah. We'll be here for probably until the mid-November. Uh, that camper, I actually paid fifty-three thousand for it. It's a twenty twenty-one. And this one, uh, around three hundred. Fifty thousand three hundred. Wow, that's yeah. So that's much better. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. What the combination? You know, having the truck yeah. and the camper. You know, I'm sitting at like right at a hundred thousand. You know, so uh -huh. yeah. You have the truck to pull the camper. Where mine's all one. Mm -hmm. So how many people uh, can or actually live in each of them? Uh, I think mine says, I can't remember how many mine says, but I have a bunk room in my camper. So I actually have a pull-out, a couch that has a pull-out bed in there. I have a couch in the living room that pulls out a bed and I have a king, a California king-size bed in the bedroom. So like probably if you do two people per bed, and I actually have a loft as well. So if you do two people up there, I can do two, four, six, eight people in there in my eight full size adults. Easy. So it's like so it's like a two bedroom apartment. Yes, sir. With a living whatever. area and a yeah. kitchen and everything. So and a bathroom. So. And this one can accommodate two. 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 <laughs> <laughs> what is inside? <laughs> it's it's only, just a discotheque floor. Actually, you could actually sleep four because the couch does make into a bed. But mm. yeah. it's really uh, most of your motorhomes are designed for couples. Oh, why it's so expensive? I don't know. <laughs> is there a swimming swimming pool inside? No, <laughs> no swimming pool. They seem no. to be better built than as far as RV. <clears throat> yeah, it's got um, like marble floors, heated heated floors, mm -hmm. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Oh, this looks great. <laughs> <laughs> there is a bedroom, bathroom, two sinks. Like a five-star hotel. I never see it. You never <laughs> I see know, like oh, it's fun. It looks great. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. Mm. It looks like a real one-bedroom flat with good furniture, appliances, sofa, and a dog. Wow. Another image of the American traveler is Forrest Gump, who has walked virtually the entire country and all of its significant events. He also loved to run to the Marshall Point Lighthouse in Maine. 
And now we have come to one of my favorite places in America. Ilya asked why we came here. Will we meet any Americans who will tell us anything? Maybe we will, maybe we won't. I think it's just Ilya's viewers. Definitely need to see this amazing lighthouse. And now Ilya will tell us why it is amazing. Who, thanks to his special sources of information, has already managed to learn a lot about it. I read on Wikipedia that it was first built in 1832 and was automated 50 years ago. It's not really remarkable in my opinion, but the Americans have turned it into a monument. And there is a museum, a huge luxury caretaker's mansion. What makes it really remarkable is that it was in the movie Forrest Gump. Yes, of course. Each of you, of course, can recognize it, because this is the lighthouse where Tom Hanks or Forrest Gump ran so vigorously to. He would run up there, stand there for a while, then turn around and run back out. That's what I'll have to do now. Of course, Ilya runs in the morning. It's not morning now, but run, Forrest, run. And I'll just walk. Anyway, friends, this is what American landmarks look like. A picnic area, a museum, and happy people sitting and watching the fog. And there are ships in the fog because they catch lobsters in this region. We were driving through the countryside and almost every house had lobster traps. There are a huge number of lobster restaurants here and Stas even told us that almost 70% of all lobster that are eaten in America are fished here. Ilya taught me a wonderful way to get verified information, so I too looked it up on Wikipedia and learned that 80 5% of all lobsters in the U.S. come from Maine. In case anyone is wondering, Portland, the largest city in Maine, is a twin city to Arhangelsk. I usually don't pay attention to this because it means almost nothing, but what is interesting is that the nature here is very reminiscent of the nature of Russian North. If not Arhangelsk region, these landscapes certainly remind me of Karelia. The only difference is that in Karelia there are not so many lobsters. There are none at all. And here they are literally at every step. After the rebels and travelers, let's go to those who are the guardians of order and freedom, of course, too. Let's meet a real American sheriff. We've come to the sheriff's office. Sheriff is a guy that breaks into a bar with guns and catches some dangerous criminals. Absolutely. In fact, I had a unique situation. The first time I went on a road trip across America, I was at my friend's house and they had a child who sat on my lap during lunch one day and hit me on the nose with a spoon. And so I jokingly said, calm down or I'll call the police. So something on the lines of calm down or I'll call the police. Of course I was just joking, as this is something I've heard growing up in USSR, but Americans were very surprised. They were like, what? What did you say? So I explained, I'll call the police, and they're looking puzzled. And, and I go and the police will punish them. So the mother of the child smiles and explains, be careful, as the police doesn't really punish. It punishes the bad people. So if you say to a child that the police will punish them, they'll think they're bad. That's one of the interesting things I quickly had to learn here. As for the sheriff, it's about local government. Here, the sheriff came before the police. It's quite interesting what a sheriff's office looks like. I'm not sure if you friends ever had to go to the police, especially in the smaller Russian regions, but if you did, you can compare it to the office here. It looks as if it is a newly renovated office, there's a lot of light, it's clean, I can see little washing machines there, water, and there are a lot of leaflets and announcements. Most of them talk about not being afraid to ask for help. It says when you can ask the sheriff for help, because sometimes things in the family happen and people don't even understand that it's a crime, that it's not something normal and okay. There is a bunch of leaflets here with different people explaining what happened. Someone deleted my family photos. I was scared. 
scared to leave him. Someone abused the cat. They threw a cat against the wall. And here's a lady saying that home violence is also a crime. And there is a special hotline number for help. The leaflet explained why home violence isn't okay. Stas rightly noticed that in Russia, 90% of things mentioned in these leaflets aren't considered as something wrong, and they can ask for help. Someone put a tracking device on my car, and it says that this is home violence too. And here, a cell phone donation box. If I understood correctly, it's a box that people can throw their cell phone into and they will then be handed to people who don't give a cell phone so they can call 911. The phones are pretty old, quite cheap, but they can help someone in an emergency. Again, a huge number of brochures explaining when to ask for help. Or how you can help if someone needs it. There is information about first aid, what should be in the first aid kit for emergency. There is a checklist that you can take home. Uh, my name is Nick Ottinger and I'm a sergeant at the Waldo County Sheriff's Office. The first question, what's the difference between police and sheriff? Sure, so uh, Sheriff's Office covers, uh, ours in particular, covers 26 towns and it's what we call rural patrol. So we break it into, depending on the uh, day, three or four different zones and you would cover, uh, you know, up to seven towns as one person whereas local police are all assigned to one town. Mm -hmm. So that spreads us out quite a bit more thin than a police department because you're covering multiple towns as one person. Uh, so it's, uh, you have to be able to be a one-man show, basically. You don't have backup around the corner right away, so we have to be self-sufficient. How do people uh, react to uh, the police, the, the sheriff? Maybe they like the police and hate the sheriff or the vice versa? Uh, from what I've seen, most people uh, respect the sheriff's office because the sheriff is an elected position. Mm -hmm. So the uh, citizens of the county vote for who they want to be their sheriff. Mm -hmm. And then that's my boss. So I feel like we, we've always had respect that way. It's the oldest established law enforcement uh, entity in the United States. We started with sheriffs back in the Wild West. And I may have to take a little bit harder line on something than if I had backup right there and a couple people helping out. But overall, I feel like we have tremendous support from our community. And what do you mean, uh, to, you mean take a harder line? Taking control of a situation. So if I roll into a fight and there's five people there, I may immediately have to go into taking somebody into custody so I'm not up against five people at once. Whereas if I was in a town and I had uh, four or five backup officers, we may be able to roll into that a little slower because I have other people that can watch my back. Just as an example, let's say you are somewhere entering, let's say a bar where you have five people fighting and uh, if you were in town with the police, you'd probably wait and say, hey, what are you guys doing here? And uh, in your position, what, you just pull a gun and what? No, no, de definitely not pull a gun for a fight. Uh, we, we meet force with equal or superior force, but it just means that if I'm trying to deal with a situation and I have five out of control people, I may put a couple of them in handcuffs because I can't watch everyone at once. I couldn't watch for somebody coming up behind me. Uh, versus local police show up with three or four guys, they may be able to stand there and talk because other people are watching, making sure no one's sneaking up behind you. But uh, if there are four or five people and you're saying, I mean, I can just put handcuffs on them, that easy? No. Uh, you can, you know, one against two or five people. I mean, you're, I mean obviously you look very fit, right? And obviously you do a lot of training, but uh, can you stand one against five? <laughs> Cer certainly not. Uh, that was just an example. But, you know, out of five people, there may be only two or three that are the problem. So, you know, I feel pretty good with the odds of two or three people. Certainly five people could grab me and do whatever they want to do to me. Um, but it's also about command presence. So if I show up, I look sharp, I look, like you said, I look fit, I'm ready to go. It's going to make people less likely to test you. And if you show up uh, with an attitude that, hey, I'm going to be here and deal with this situation, 
versus, and that's what I mean by taking a hard line. I may show up and say, this is what's going to happen. Here's what we're going to do. Whereas if I showed up and I was passive or not as aggressive, people might see that as weakness and opportunity to come at me. What crimes are most often committed here in the city? Yeah, we, we run a range from uh, drug offenses. There is a drug epidemic going on in the United States mm -hmm. right now. We have a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of overdoses, which is something we're working on. So there's a lot of drug crimes. With drug crimes come everything from uh, robberies, burglaries, thefts, violent crimes between drug dealers. Um, and we also have a pretty big domestic violence problem of people abusing their spouses. I would say those are probably two of the more common things that we deal with. Have you ever, and that's back to Ilya's question, uh, felt any, I don't know, disrespect or any bad attitude on the part of the people you had to uh, work with or just ordinary people? Oh, and again, yeah. the question we ask that is because, for example, uh, like in Russia, you cannot imagine anything uh, like we have, you have here. You know. Overall, I think we have tremendous support of our communities. People want to be able to be in their home at night and Hopefully nothing happens, but if it does, there's a bunch of guys that have equipment that are ready. Let's say your door gets kicked in at three in the morning and somebody's breaking in. We have a group of guys and girls that are ready to go that will show up and take care of that problem. And people feel more comfortable in their homes in general by having a, a place that can respond to that. You know, when, some, when children are abused and there's an entity that will go find the abuser and take them into custody so they can't abuse children anymore. I think the general public appreciates that. Um, of course, when we deal with somebody that's broken the law, they don't want to get in trouble for it. They don't want to pay fines. They don't want to go to jail. So of course we've had people call us awful things and say disparaging things and fight us and all that. But it's typically folks that are doing the wrong thing and then they got caught and they don't like being caught. They don't like authority asserting onto them and saying, hey, look, our laws say you can't do that, and now you have to answer for it. Those are the folks that, that go against us. Um, certainly, there's been controversial situations that have happened across the United States, and like anything else in society, law enforcement is a slice of humanity. We have great police officers and sheriffs across this country, and we have some not so good ones. And sometimes they end up in the media, but it doesn't speak for the, the whole group. You know, when I, like I was born and grew up in the Soviet Union, yeah. Soviet Union, you know, a long time ago. So, and uh, we had this general thing, like where, when your mom or your dad, especially your moms, they could tell you something. If you don't behave, I'll call the police. Right. It was called militia not police in Russia, in the Soviet Union. So they say, I'll call the police. And that was like a threat. Right. You know, everybody was afraid. I'll call the police. So anything like that here? Uh, if anything, we're trying to establish good relationships with the children that we do interact with when we go to the different, because there's always kids at the calls. We try to have a good interaction with them so they can trust us later on if they need help. Right, but probably uh, the thing is, uh, when, I, when I say children, I mean children aged literally five, six, seven, you know, that's uh, what I had to deal with when I was a kid. If, if at five years old, you have a good interaction with a police officer, you'll remember that. Um, maybe your parents' vehicle broke down on the side of the road and we show up and we call a tow truck and we give you a ride home. And you remember, hey, it was scary. We're in the dark, we're on the side of the road, but the police showed up and they got our vehicle towed and they gave us a ride home. And you establish several of those starting young all the way up through. Later on in life, if they need help with something, they, they trust the entity that they're going to call. Uh, what is freedom to you? Freedom? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, freedom is the ability to make choices that affect your own life uh, with minimal interference from the government. But I, I do believe that there has to be some sort of structure and guardrails that keep you within that freedom. For example, I should be free to you know, walk around my property and play outside with my kids, but I shouldn't be free to go over and punch my neighbor. So it's willing to make choices around your life with some, a little bit of guardrails on the side.
If we talk about sheriffs and police in the US and Europe, it's interesting that they can wear a beard. We were talking to a sheriff, he had this nice beard that wouldn't be allowed in Russia. In Russia, according to the rules, you can only have a small moustache like Lukashenko. If you are a general or another important person, you cannot have a beard, except you are a policeman in Chechnya. They've made an exception there, I think. They can have a beard and look completely different. Also, the sheriff had tattoos all over his arms. This is not allowed in Russia as well. That's because it's against the code. Yes, it's against the code. And I think it's an important factor in terms of trusting the police, because if a policeman is a cool guy with a beard and tattoos, just in special uniform, people trust them more. I must say that it's not only a sheriff or a firefighter with tattoos that I've seen here, but also an orthodox Christian priest in the north of the New York state. He had tattoos and wore jeans under the robe. So I've asked him why. And he answered that until he serves God and the people, it doesn't matter how he wears. I think that when a person does their job and doesn't discredit it, they can do whatever they want. But here we can start a discussion what is discredited. That's probably why Americans love their police and even buy their merchandise. Speaking of attitudes towards the police, yes, there's a problem with the police here, especially if you remember how the BLM protest started. There are a lot of questions to the police, but nevertheless, there are souvenir stores behind me. There is a lot of merchandise with the NYPD logo on it. Once again, this is a commercial souvenir store. It's not some specialized police store. It's just regular New York souvenirs. And judging by the fact that the owners of this store put things with NYPD logo in the window, people buy them. Them. It's hard to imagine that anyone in Russia would buy a t-shirt or something with the logo of the Moscow police or the Moscow Special Purpose Police Unit, but here they do. So what's the difference between American and Russian freedom? What's freedom means for you? You know, and this is a great question because I'll never forget. Um, and some, and it might have been Stas, but some Russians who were who were visiting me here in the U.S. and and they made this comment. You know, you Americans think you are free, yes. but everywhere I turn, there's a sign telling you what you can't do. <laughs> and it might have been us. We were walking down the middle of the road, drunk. One I, night. I, th I thought I decided to show off and said, "You are a nation who can, that can be controlled by traffic lights." <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you all own cars. <laughs> and being in Russia, you know, I, my first visit there, marshes taking me uh, through the streets of Moscow in the middle of the night, and I'm just waiting to be mugged or shot or killed, because that would be the feeling of walking around in a big city in the U.S. in the middle of the night. And it was, it was just perfectly safe, you know, and perfectly free. And, and, and again, it was kind of pointed out to me, you can do anything you want in Russia, just don't mess with the government. You know, don't mess with the, the powers that be. So what is freedom? Uh, yes. Yeah, is, is that a freedom with a governmental system or a society that lets you do anything you want as long as you don't mess with Putin? Or is, is freedom more of a society where there's rules and regulations for the benefit of all people to live happy and be equal and all that kind of good stuff, which means there aren't a whole lot of freedoms because you have guidelines, you have laws, you have rules. So what is freedom is, is a really good question. Um, I think freedom is, I feel free. You, know? you feel free. I feel free. You know, um, I, I don't feel like there's someone, you know, on my phone. I don't feel like there's someone uh, wondering how I voted. I, I, you know, I don't feel like uh, there, there's someone walking behind me, wondering what am I doing? Who am I talking to? So in that sense, I feel free to walk around, say what I want for the most part, go where I want, when I want to go. 
Um, but there's stoplights. The idea of freedom in Russia was best articulated by none other than our great idol, Margarita Simonyan, who said, love your boss, love your homeland, and do whatever you want, may you be happy. And this is actually true in Russia. I've talked to a lot of people. I understand perfectly well that a person in Russia, if they want to, can get behind the wheel drunk, drive, and be quite free in their choice of behavior. And if they're stopped, not everywhere but it may be possible to negotiate with the person in charge. This is also a known form of freedom. You can go for a swim in a fountain, pee in a public place, and that's also an option if you love your boss, your homeland, and don't go against the party line. You know, in a way, the thing about China is that if you don't want much, why not have it? For a huge number of people in this world, power is sacred, so they don't touch it. So for them, talking about freedom in the context of being able to criticize power and everything else is very relevant. You put forward the thesis that many people can give up freedom and many don't need it. And here's a great example from Russia. After the Russian every citizen has, for the most part, given up their freedom and delegated their rights and freedoms to the state, once they said they didn't need free elections, that they didn't need free mass media because there were good TV series and the political was of little interest to them. The main thing is that we have free medicine, education, we had a wonderful Soviet Union, we have ideals and wonderful nature, kind people and everything is wonderful. We live in our own little world and we are certainly not threatened by anything. But at some point the state came to these people and said, now friends, you are going to get QR codes, you are going to get vaccinations. And if you remember last year, this was probably the most important test for the Kremlin, because the people from small cities, the obedient people from afar, who were were united around the government, around Putin, around stability, they suddenly rebelled. Remember Volodin's telegram channel where people were angry and cursing him? How dare you suddenly force us to vaccinate? Here again one should understand that it's impossible to give in to one thing so that tomorrow people won't come chasing for more. So a comfortable life where you give up your freedoms hoping that the government won't come after you is impossible. They'll come after you, but you won't have the ability to defend yourself then. So Americans claim that freedom is their main value. On many posters, especially those that glorify the army, you can see that we fight for freedom, we defend our freedom. And today we will discuss what freedom is. Stas, how do you characterize the concept of freedom. What is freedom for you? Look, there is inner freedom and the freedom of opportunity. In my opinion, inner freedom is more precious, as that's when a person feels great regardless of external circumstances. But for the majority of people, freedom is, first of all, opportunity. The possibility of self-fulfillment in their career, financially, saying what they think, thinking what they think is right, and not getting prison sentences threats to their lives or any other serious restriction which prevent a person from self-fulfillment. I agree with you, you said it all very well. To me, freedom is also being who you want to be, and that's a pretty interesting opportunity. But it's also important to be able to protect your interests, to protect your views. This, by the way, is why you and I wanted to talk about Russia now. The main complaint, it seems to me, is that in Russia you have few opportunities to defend your freedom. That is, you can be whatever you want, of course. You can dye your hair, you can read Nova Gazeta. Not anymore. Well, yes, Nova Gazeta no longer exists when we are recording this. But still, in Russia they will say that no one is bothering anyone. You can sleep with whoever you want, and it's true, but sooner or later you face the fact that they're either the state or some other people come to you and start disagreeing with you. And at that point you just don't have the ability to defend yourself. Well, look, it is clear that if you ask the American, and I, as someone who has lived here for a long time, can certainly consider myself an American. And if you ask me, I will find something to criticize American freedom 
and liberty is for. But in terms of comparing America and Russia, of course it's like apples and oranges. They are two different civilizations, precisely because when your freedom is restricted in the United States, you have a wide range of possibilities for seeking justice through the courts and all different kinds of media that exist in society. That is, you have the opportunity to fight, to defend your freedom. I hope you all understand that freedom of speech and media freedom is something there will never be other freedoms without. So please like this video, share it and help promote it. And wait for the next episode of the series.